Hi, I'm Amy Karanik, a Sculpey brand ambassador, and today we're looking at making veneers. Veneers are a very popular way to make lots of different kinds of projects. We'll look at three different styles, terrazzo, silkscreen, and marbling. Once our veneers are made, we'll make these cool earrings and this votive holder. All right, what we have here are some veneered projects. And first, let's define what a veneer is. Um, a veneer is like a decorative surface that's generally quite thin. We borrow this term, you know, from woodworking projects. But the veneer itself can be like any number of patterns or prints. Like this one we call a terrazzo. Uh, this one is silk screened. This, this top portions are marbled. And the benefit of a veneer is that you can decorate a very thin, thin sheet of clay for example, and you can spread your pattern and your process out over a very thin sheet, but then you can use other clays to back the veneer so that you're not wasting your hard won veneer, you know, on the thickness that's required to make something. So, for example, these little dishes need to be a certain thickness um, in order for them to stand alone and support themselves. So the veneers are just the patterned areas that you see on the top and then they've been backed by possibly some scraps of clay or blended clays, some thicker clay that's going to give it its strength and rigidity. So we're going to look at making three different styles of veneers. We're going to make the terrazzo, the marbled, and the silk screen. And then I'm going to show you how to use those in these projects. So we'll just set these aside for now. Just some good samples of veneers. Okay, um, first we are going to take a look at doing a silk screen. I'm going to get that one done and then we're going to set it aside so that it can dry. Okay, so a silk screened veneer is done with paint. And, and a silk screen. So I have a sheet of Sedona Souffle already um, sheeted through my pasta machine on the thickest set. Uh, it's actually the number two setting. It's not the thickest, it's the number two. I think number two is, is nice for earrings. Um, it's still a very light weight. It's still thin, but it's still strong enough to support its, its own weight. It won't sag or droop or bend. So this has been uh, processed through the pasta machine on the number two setting. And I'm rolling it because I find that my pasta machine um, kind of puts lines in the, in the clay. And so I just use that acrylic roller to smooth that out. Now what you can't see off camera is I have my silk screen here. This is our Sculpey Feathers silk screen. And I always sheet my clay to like accommodate the whole screen because you can get a lot of really nice cuts out of this whole screen and so I try to usually you know get the whole screen on one sheet um, so this is the full width of the pasta machine on the number two setting also what you're not noticing is that I have a little tray of water right here and so that is ready because I want to make sure and get the paint out of my screen as quickly as I can so that my screen is easy to use over and over and over. I also have the squeegee that came in the silk screen set. So I'm just going to burnish this down and one side is a little bit smoother than the other. I can tell by, by feeling it. I'm going to put this in place on my clay and burnish it down. Now if it bothers you, you can trim that excess clay away or you can leave it. Just make sure there's no air bubbles between the screen and the clay. And then I've got my squeegee ready and this squeegee will go like almost the whole width. This is glossy white acrylic paint and I like to use glossy paint on top of souffle because there's this real nice um, contrast between the glossy finish of the paint and the flatness of souffle. Just place a bead of the paint right up along one edge like so. And then take your squeegee. I'm going to hold it at a 45 to the clay. You might not be able to tell but that's kind of the angle I'm working at. First I'm going to go up here and grab that paint and then I'm just going to drag it toward myself. And I'm using a lot of pressure 
And don't worry if there's areas where you don't have quite enough paint, just grab some more and drag it. I find that it really doesn't matter if I have to drag this more than once to cover the whole thing. I've never really experienced any problem with that. Okay, now I'm gonna put my squeegee right in the water and I'm just gonna real carefully peel the edge. So satisfying to see that beautiful, beautiful image right on the clay. I just love that. And then this goes right in the water, ASAP, to preserve that screen, get all that, keep all that paint soft so that it cleans up easily. I'm gonna grab a paper towel. And then the screen can be completely dried and ready to use again. So I can't tell you how many times I've used this exact same screen. Uh, I love it so much. Okay, so now this needs to dry on here. Um, the acrylic paint will dry completely on the unbaked clay and we can use it to do a project. So I'm just gonna set this aside and let that paint dry. We will do our little terrazzo votive while I'm waiting for this to dry. And then we can handle this with dry paint on top. All right, setting that aside. Okay, let me just do a little two second tidy. All right, next let's take a look at doing this terrazzo veneer. Um, and I love the terrazzo. There's lots and lots of methods for doing terrazzo. And you can find a lot of those on our website, sculpey.com. You'll, um, you'll see a terrazzo that's in a veneer form. You can do terrazzo where it goes all the way through the clay. Um, so many different ways to achieve this look, but it's really nice and it's a good random kind of abstract look. Great way to use up scrap clay. Um, I just really like that a lot. Okay, so what I have here is a whole bar of um, white in the souffle igloo. And what I wanna do is make sure, I have this little glass votive, which is what that was. I wanna make sure this can roughly go around here. So I'm just doing a check, just to make sure I have the clay kind of the right shape and size to go around, and this will work out really great right here. Okay, so that's a good check. I'm gonna roll this down, and I like to kind of, when I'm doing these terrazzos, I like to kind of burnish this down um, to my work surface. I see a lot of lint and stuff on here. I'm not gonna clean that up right now, but if you need to clean up lint or fingerprints from the surface of clay, you can do that with um, some rubbing alcohol on a cotton swab or on a Q-tip. You can just go right on there and lift that up. What I have here is a sheet of souffle in the color Cabernet, and I have this sheeted through the pasta machine on the number six setting. And what I like to do for this terrazzo veneer method is just tear it off. And I am always going to put place my darkest color down first. This is just kind of my method for not going bonkers. <laughs> I have these little tips and tricks that I use on myself to keep me focused and get work done. And so this Cabernet is gonna always be my biggest color. It's my darkest color. It's going down first and I'm just tearing it so that it gets those really cool, um, no two pieces the same, it gets a nice little rough edge. Just adds a lot more visual interest to the piece to have those torn edges like that, okay? Now if you want to, you could put a few more smaller pieces in the mix. Generally, I keep each color in kind of its own shape and system of application. Um, so that there is some continuity to it. It's not just completely haphazard. That's the, that's the way I work. So pushing those on. Okay, next I wanna take my roller and really burnish this down. I want that Cabernet Souffle to just marry with the Igloo Souffle underneath and I am rolling it until, until it's flat. I want those to be an even level, just like a beautiful terrazzo floor would be. Okay, so that's the Cabernet. Next I have this yellow ochre sheet. This is also souffle. And I'm gonna tear it and apply it as well. But this time I'm going to 
um, you can see from my finished sample that generally my yellow ochre pieces are much smaller than the Cabernet ones and that again just helps keep me focused. Um, I've found through trial and error that keeping each color in kind of its own system of, of shape and size um, brings the uniformity that is necessary to make it look like a good design. That's all I'm trying to say. And I do like to kind of overlap. Um, what's great about souffle in this technique is that souffle has such flat, opaque colors that um, you can truly overlap um, a light color like this over a dark one. Just one of the many benefits of souffle, even in this very thin, you know, limited amount. So I like to overlap because that just creates even more continuity and, and you know, a kind of a certain randomness. Okay, like they're floating. That's the yellow ochre and we're going to roll that again. We're going to roll it until it's flat and level. And I'm sorry that I'm shaking the table, but I'm doing art and sometimes art is shaky. You can quote me on that. Art can be shaky. Okay, that's all flat and level. Our final color is going to be this citron. This is also souffle in citron or citron or I don't know. I call it citron. Um, this time I'm going to do something completely different with this color. I'm going to create these more like olive shaped dots. So just rolling a little rope, I'm going to use this blade and each time I cut one off I'm just going to turn it sideways and press it to the, to the piece. I'm using a lot of fingertip pressure so those are sinking right down into the clay background. So you can see how this type of veneering technique, um, you're using a lot less of your topical colors. You're not, they're not going all the way through the clay, so you use less of them. Um, I feel like you have a lot of really good control over the pattern that you develop. Just a lot of benefits like to starting out with veneers because you have so much control over how much clay you use and um, the way you use the clay. All right, so just kind of get, you know, back up from time to time and look at that and make sure, make sure you haven't, you, that you're keeping it really random. <laughs> okay. Use the um, roller one more time and really move those citron dots down level to the rest of the sheet so that when you touch this the whole thing just feels flat. If you wanted to you could pick it up and run it through your pasta machine at this point. Okay so that is really good. Let's get this stuff out of our way and we'll just do a quick tutorial on adding clay to a glass vessel. So um, that's a cool thing about oven bake polymer clay is that it bakes or cures in your home oven at such a low temperature, only 275 degrees, that so many things can be used as forms in the oven with the clay because they will not burn at 275. And so glass, metal, um, paper mache, paper, cardstock, cardboard, all of those are fair game for covering with polymer. I always start um, a little straight edge just to keep myself organized and I'm going to line this up on the edge of, of the glass. Now this glass has an unusual curve to it so as I wrap the clay around I need to be controlling. Uh, the most easy thing is that the clay is going to want to go like that and that's not, that's not going to be a happy project in the end. So I'm going to force the clay to stick with the shape of the glass and I can do that because souffle is so stretchy and easy to work with that as I go around I'm re-stretching it to keep going the right direction. I'm also paying a lot of attention 
let me show you where I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention right here because that nice curve, we want the clay to really follow that nice curve. And that would be the place where air bubble would want to get trapped if you don't seat that clay right down into the curve. Okay, so pay attention. Use your fingertips to feel that the clay, you know, is, ad is, is touching the glass. Okay, here I am at where my wrap meets my original um, starting point. So what I can do is just touch that seam together and then if I roll this back, I can see it's created a line here for me to follow with my blade. Now polymer clay likes to stretch, so if your gap is a little big, you can just stretch it to fill that in. And you want this clay to butt um, joint to joint. You don't want to overlap. We don't want like a thick bulge there. We want it to really, truly, totally overlap. Okay, and that's a pretty good seam right there. All right, now I'm just going back using my fingertips to make sure I don't feel any air bubbles, okay? All right, another thing to consider when you're covering glass is the shape of the glass. Um, you, once it's wrapped in clay, you want the clay to stay on the glass voluntarily. And what I mean by that is clay and glass don't ever bond permanently, but if you trap the glass vessel with the clay, it's, you can't get the clay off unless you break it. So that's why up here I have a lip sealing the edge of the top of the glass and I have a slight lip down here sealing the glass and capturing, trapping the glass in place. So let's start with the bottom one first because that's the most obvious. I'm just gently um, pulling the edge of the clay around the bottom ever so slightly. I don't need to waste clay completely covering the bottom. I just want to kind of trap the glass in there. And then I'm riding my blade around the flat surface of the glass as I trim the clay. Okay, now I'm going to go back and with fingertip pressure, I'm going to push the clay over the edge of the glass again, just slightly. Okay, now at this point, if you want to, you could make you could just keep pushing it over the edge and make a really nice little neat rim so that if someone picks this up, it looks neat on the bottom too. Or you could trim it back as much as you like. But you do want to make sure that it sits really flat on the, on the table because if you're going to use this as a candle holder, um, you want, you know, you don't want to topple or anything. Okay, now I'm ready for the top and what I'm going to do is first I'm going to trim this even with the top. So all I have to do is get my blade in there and a good starting point and then let my blade follow the glass around. Okay, before I finish that top edge, I want to consider since this is glass, I can see down in there and I can see where there might be air bubbles between the clay and the glass. Air likes to expand when you heat it. So if you have trapped air bubbles between clay and glass, it may decide to expand to the point of cracking the clay. So I'm just taking a little extra time and looking for air bubbles through the glass where there might be a problem. Now I can never get the bubbles out 100%, but I do give an effort to get most of them out that I can. And then I feel like I've used good technique to make a good product. Okay, next I want to note that on this finished piece, I just barely went around the edge trapping the glass. I did not go inside where the flame will be. I don't ever wanna go inside where the flame will be if I'm making votives. Um, Clay cures at 275 and that's not very hot and a flame would get way hotter than that. So we just want to exercise some caution and not put clay on the inside of the votive. Okay, and I'm just going to take a few moments here to really make this edge look nice. So first I'm just bending it around 
And then I've got some little bobbles I can trim. I've got a couple right here where the clay was actually trying to go down inside the rim. And that looks a little messy right there, so I'll just take my fingertips and keep working that area, even smoothing it a bit with my thumb. So if I was at home, I would really take my time and examine that well and probably fuss over it quite a bit just to make that rim as nice as I want it to look so that if someone says, hey, this is nice, I say, well, I made that and feel like I did a good job. So I don't want to bore you with all my schmoozing and mooshing and mushing. So let's move on to what we're going to do about this seam. Okay, so the cool thing about terrazzo is it's really easy to hide the seams by just putting a little bit more of your clay accent right across the seam like it's supposed to be there. So I'm just going to add a little yellow right where that yellow is. And I'm going to try to get that wrinkle out of the white. And let's put just like one more green dot over the seam. And then from a distance, it'll be real hard to tell, you know, where that seam was. It just looks seamless. Okay. So then that goes in your home oven at 275 for about 30 minutes. And when it comes out, you've got a gift worthy um, little votive holder that you could make in any color for any season for any, any celebration, custom colors to fit the day. Okay. So let's set those aside. And um, these scraps, these are awesome scraps that you could use for, for marbling, marbled clay or for you could cut out shapes and make some earring parts. Save all that stuff. And speaking of saving, let me just real quickly show you how to save veneers or parts of veneers. You just want to store them flat. I've got this cool plastic box that's been hauled and hauled. So in here, what I have is these deli wraps and you can buy deli wrap at a box store um, in big boxes you can get a lifetime supply of this <laughs> and what's cool about it is it doesn't leach the oil out of the polymer clay so if you have sheets of clay you can lay them between layers of this deli wrap and in here i have all kinds of veneers that i've saved and i might i might want to use them later here's even a silk screened piece like we're doing today and parts of slabs and just different pieces that I'm not ready to part with, but I haven't had time to do anything with them. And so you just want to keep your veneers really flat and between non leaching plastic, you could even use kitchen saran um, because you don't want the oil from the clay to leach out and that will cause it to dry. So that's how you can store them. Some people store them in, um, like binder, plastic binder sleeves. That's another way to do it. So, all right, let's move back to um, creating these earrings out of the silk screen piece. And I'll just grab my colors over here and pull them in. So here's our silk screen piece that we um, made earlier. And if you're not brave enough, you could just try right out here where I had that scrap um, paint and you can see that it's completely dry to the touch that the acrylic paint has dried on there in just the time it took us to do that other project. Um, this is already dry. And at this point, it's, you know, functional. You can use it. You could wrap it around a votive like that last project. You can do whatever you want with it. And so um, you don't want to drag your hands across it. You can kind of lift the paint up. But um, anyway, it's really ready to use. So I've got some cutters that I want to make those earrings out of. And and what's a great thing is you can just like go in here and audition, you know, the different look that you want your earrings to take on. And so I'm just going to cut and I'm going to cut like conservatively so that I don't waste, um, you know, a lot of clay with my cuts. I'm, I'm going to do just random cuts. And like I've told you before in other videos, I always smooth that cutting edge with my fingertips after I use any type of a cutter. I always go back and smooth. Okay. 
So now this leftover piece, I'll preserve that in my veneer storage box between pieces of that wrap and I'll be able to use it on another project. So for the centers of these, um, I cut out the same shape I'm using for the uh, marble tops. So I'll just go ahead and do that. I'll just cut these out and set those aside. Those could be another pair of earrings. Just a coordinating little cut. And what's cool about making veneers um, in different patterns is that now you have all these color coordinating thin pieces that you can, you know, combine in various ways, um, you know, to make to make different design elements. So you could do another whole design the opposite way of these. Okay, so I've got my big pieces there. And next I want to show you a marbling technique that I came that I have. You can do marbling in any way you want. Um, I kind of like this marbling technique because it creates really random and maybe more organic style of marbling. Um, I like my marbling to look organic as opposed to sometimes when you do a marbling technique it'll turn out looking um, striped or it'll just look too organized and I find with this chopping technique um, I kind of enjoy the chopping and then I kind of get this real random organic looking marbling. So I've just chopped those up with my blade and I used my blade to kind of help mix the colors and now what I'm doing is I'm sticking the little bits to each other. This is also another way to do terrazzo like that already looks like terrazzo right there. So I'm going to roll over the top to make those all seal together. Okay now I'm going to pull this up and I'm going to roll over the back all right. Okay, now I want to do a bit of folding. And this folding kind of creates a partial, like lets the colors kind of blend together, but not a lot. Because I want some blending, but I also want some organic shaping to it. I'm rolling again. And I just basically push from the outside in. I don't want to. I don't want to make a new color. I just want to create really random marbling. And we're starting to get there now. We're getting some weird striations that look like, um, you know, almost like land formations. And that's, that's kind of what I'm going for. We'll do that one more time. It's kind of hard to describe, but it works. And you can obviously use either side of this that you want to. All right. Put it down one more time. Now that's about the same thickness as my larger pieces, which is important. You want there to be a uniformity there. I'm really digging this area, so I'm going to do a cut here. And let's see, I like this area a lot. So I'm going to do a cut here. And then just remove that. You can put that in your veneer storage area. And then let's let's kind of frame these up as how they would be as as earrings so that we can put some holes in them for I'm sorry if I'm getting off center let's move it back I'll show you how I put holes in them for to accommodate jump rings for later assembly once you've got that lined up you'll want to just poke some holes to accommodate your jump rings I'm using the blunt point tool and I always go through one way 
and then I'll gently pick it up and go through the other to push that little rim of clay back to the inside. You can also use um, a Dremel tool, if you like, to poke holes or to drill holes in baked clay, whatever you, whichever method you prefer. I think I've done a whole video on jewelry finishing that is available on Sculpey.com to talk about you know, using a Dremel tool as opposed to, to drilling holes with a tool uh, in soft clay. So just poking that back in, okay? These are ready to go in the oven and bake 275 for about a half an hour and then they'll be really nice and strong. I'll just quickly give you a little tutorial on using jump rings. This one's already, I've got the uh, back glued on the top. I've got the jump ring secured. So I'll just show you quickly how to use jump rings. I just use pliers as an extension of my fingers because they have a lot of strength and they're a lot smaller than my fingertips. It doesn't matter that this one's curved and this one's flat. I'm just, they're both flat when they grab. I've got the seam and the jump ring at the top and I'm just twisting one plier toward me and one plier away. So basically you wanna always open jump rings like this, not like this. You don't wanna stretch jump rings, you wanna twist them. And then once that's done, um, you can use uh, the pliers again, just like an extension of your fingers to work the jump ring through the holes that you made in the baked clay. Once they're both in there, just grab with your pliers and go the opposite way, twisting one away from you and one toward you. And then when the jump ring perfectly lines up at that seam, um, that is what you need for strength and wearability. We hope you've enjoyed learning about veneers and how to use the veneers to make the earrings and votive holder. And if you'd like to be inspired by thousands more projects, please check out our website, Sculpey.com. We would also love to see what you make. So if you post to social media, please use the hashtag Sculpey and hashtag HowDoYouSculpey so that we can check out your work as well.